And we sometimes talk about the, our mother country and our, you know, the motherland. And so with Mother's Day just a couple days away, I want to, to share some things in that regard. And first of all, though, I want to share something that, you know, us, us men have uh, a circumstance that on the 24th of June, in the year of our Lord, 1776, this was right after we had had our success at Boston, and I had, um, who is now in New York, I wrote a letter to my dear Martha. It says, my dear Martha, <coughs> you have hurt me, I know not how much. There are a thousand ways you could have interpreted my lack of writing in ways less injurious than you have. Um, I acknowledge that I have not always been so punctilious in the, the duties of uh, correspondence with you. But you should know that since I first saw you, I've cleaved and clung to you with the warmest of affections. I think I dug out of my hole with that last phrase. But anyway, <laughs> you have to understand that my dear Martha was doing as women are wont to do, and that is complaining I wasn't writing her enough. <laughs> now understand that I was in the process of moving the army from Boston to New York to prepare for the assault of 30,000 British. And, if you might like to know, the British were intercepting my letters to her. So I might have some excuse, ladies. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's me. <laughs> But how did my dear Martha, the, the rest of the story, how did my dear Martha respond to my gentle child? Did she get her nose bent out of joint and just stay at Mount Vernon? No. She came to the winter headquarters after the harvest time, and then when she was at these cold places in New Jersey and New York, did she just sit around the fire and warm her toes? No. She went out and darned the socks of the soldiers, mended their uniforms, and nursed them back to health. Now that, my friends, is love of country. But there's another love of country that I learned as a young man. First, my father told me, to do this love of country. And this is a love of country I encourage children to do. And all of us are children. But when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, I was off visiting my cousins in King George, Virginia, which is about halfway between Fredericksburg and Ferry Farm and Pope's Creek, uh, where I was born. And I saw off in the distance, you know, a, a horse and rider riding up furiously and as he came closer I saw his Uncle Samson and he came and said Master George, Master George you gotta come home right away your daddy's not feeling well your mama says you gotta come home right away and so I got on my horse and I rode home as quickly as I could and I found my father in bed in the middle of the day well my father was a very industrious man he was part owner in an iron forge he operated Ferry Farm he was a sheriff in the town he was a vestryman in the church Later on in my life, I followed in his example. I ran a ferry, an iron forge at Shenandoah, and I, I had the Mount Vernon, and, and I was a vestryman at Christ Church, and, and I served in my community as a magistrate and as a burgess and as a president. But I got home, and my father, on his deathbed, gave me a priceless inheritance gave me three books. Because he knew in his father's love that he wasn't going to be there in my life to guide me. So I was going to have to get my guidance in life from our Father in heaven through prayer. So he gave me those three books on prayer. And it shaped the course of my life and it shaped the course of the life of our country. And that's love of country. When we pray to our Father for do my duty to God and my country. 
but also my dear mother, who has been spoken of most harshly, and I need to correct that record. Some people said that she was a domineering woman. Well, maybe that characterized me as a general, and I got it from my mother. But they said that, uh, you know, she uh, complained about this and that. Well, one of the things, when I took the task to give the message to the French commander in the Ohio territories, she said, forget not the duty of secret prayer. And never has a son more willingly accepted his mother's guidance. And so it was my practice to daily pray, morning and evening. That was my daily sacrifice. And I have a book of that called Prayer Warrior Washington. But I want to share with you a poem by a great patriot named Jed Fleshman of Columbia, South Carolina. And so it was my habit to kneel as I pray. I recall times when I, George Washington, knelt humbly in prayer. One time was Christmas at Valley Forge in the crisp snow and frigid air. <coughs> My soul was solemn in the moonlit glen where I'd come to pray for the lives of my men. Their clothing inadequate to keep out the cold and their bare feet were bloody. From jagged ice, I was told, food rations were short and the cold nights long. I, General Washington, knelt in prayer for deliverance from this wrong. Men shouldn't suffer and die because of nothing to eat. Torn, ragged clothing and no shoes for their feet. I could see hurt and worry and tears in their eyes. The pain in men's cries. So I come here to pray <coughs> in the secret place. As commander in chief, I was seeking God's grace. I prayed a blessing on all of us. I, George Washington, could discern that in this time of great need, the way we must turn today, I do pray our leaders would bend on their knees and learn <coughs> in Christ to depend. <coughs>